Okay, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this evening's engineering group uh, April evening meeting. Tonight we uh, welcome Jim Rose of the Royal of Royal Holloway University of London, who will be talking on the factors um, affecting mid-latitude quaternary landscape change. Um, Jim's interests and expertise cover a wide range of quaternary science and geomorphology. Um, with his more recent work focused on providing quaternary landscape designations for end users, such as engineers, asset owners, and uh, local authorities. Um, and as the links between the disciplines of engineering, geology, and quaternary science begin to grow, I think it's key that we in industry also play an active role in the process of knowledge sharing between these two scientific uh, disciplines, and hence why we got Jim to present tonight. Um, just to note, at the end of the lecture, we'll conduct a brief Q&A session, and because we've got people watching online, um, if you could raise your hand and explain who you are before outlining your question, I'll then uh, bring the microphone to you. And so without further ado, we'll get Jim to start his presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I didn't know it was going to be streamed online, so it's a surprise to me. It's possibly a surprise to you. We'll just see how that goes. Um, the, the title is um, somewhat obscure, I think, in the sense that it's, it's essentially a scientific title, but I hope you'll find that the outcome of what I'm going to say is very relevant, um, and I hope that you might even be able to use it in some of your work. So um, we, we go from there. Um, there we are, sorry. Yeah. Um, the lecture is essentially based on my experience as a quaternary scientist and geomorphologist. And I've worked on a wide range of topics, and it's, it's, it just seems to me in the last, in recent years, I've been doing this work that has got practical application. Um, it's been through my own work, but also I've been associated with the GEOL survey, and it's worked with the geological survey as well. So it's, it reflects those, my own academic background, and, my own, and also commercial, and my own work with the, the GEOL survey. And one of the issues that's always driven me mad, to put it bluntly, is a lot of maps are there designed for stratigraphers. And there we are, there's one on there, and that's fine. It's exactly what stratigraphers want, and you want to know if you know the age of rocks and their general characteristics. But it, there's other properties you can show on maps about rocks, and those properties can be of use to people who are dealing with the land directly. And that has underpinned uh, what I'm going to say in this lecture. And it's interesting for me, in this lecture, when I, I lectured here, I was the first person here ever to lecture without a tie. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and the lectures in the past have sort of been a story of the landscape development or a story of the geological development, as it's like. Uh, and this is different, but I will put a little bit of, of stories of landscape development in the lecture as I go along. Right. All right, okay, I think, uh, okay, so the point is this, we need to understand, the point is that we need to understand, I'm having a communication with the person at the top, yeah. okay. Anyway, we, we need to understand the processes that create the, the landscape, create the surface geology and the geomorphology, which we're all interested in. So I've taken what, Forcing process would happen in an area like this. Like I said, a mid-latitude uh, temperate area. Um, and I've used Britain, but, you know, wherever you are, you can apply these the same approach. It really doesn't matter where you are. But I'm just using this for my own experience and hopefully yours as well. And I'm, I'm looking at the forces that are applied, the classic forces, the uh, uh, kinetic and potential energy forces that are applied to form the terrain. And I want to look at the way... The, these forces have interacted uh, over time, over quaternary time, but also even pre-quaternary time, um, and in terms of the neotectonic history of this same region. And if you wanted to read about this in more detail, I've actually published it in this paper in Journal of Quaternary Science. Uh, it was in, when was it? I can't even remember when it was. Uh, there we go, 2010. Um, and it, it, this outlines the gist of what I'm going to say in this lecture. 
Um, but I'm also going on from that work to some more work that I've done with colleagues at the Geological Survey, uh, which we've tried to apply many of the principles using BGS's maps uh, to quantify this information in terms of the processes. And that work is with Steve Booth and John Merritt, both of the formerly of the Geological Survey, um, and we've published that in the Proceedings of the Geologists Association. So again, if you want to see that, that was in uh, 2015. 20, uh, uh, so you can see that there if you want to uh, look at this further. And I would like to make a plug for the PGA now because it's really pushed, published a number of papers that are of value to end users, whether it be engineering geologists or utilities people. Um, these papers don't get terribly well cited, but they get exceedingly well downloaded and used. And indeed, one uh, won a prize at Lloyd's of London beating papers in journals like Nature uh, and uh, Journal of Geophysical Research. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased with this. And so don't forget to look at the Geologist Association proceedings. So we'll start with the lecture then, and I want to look first at process-based stratigraphy. I want to look at uh, mapping and stratigraphic schemes that may be of some use. And if you don't think so, you tell me at the end. The detail on this doesn't matter. The critical thing is, this is the, the stratigraphy that's been applied to the criteria of Britain. There's over 1,400 terms in that, and I've just listed 15 of them, and that's really difficult to handle. The point is, they're really not as much use to you. In my opinion, they're damn useless. Uh, and I'm being responsible for some of them. Um, so they're okay for trying to understand glacials and interglacials, but not much use for that, to be honest. Um, but they're not much use if you want to understand the landscape and use it. So I try to develop a system that would give information its value. And I wanted to see how understanding rocks and landform would give you a better insight into the materials and the slopes of the landforms, uh, which would respond to any force, you know, when you're doing something on it. As you know, building a road, building HS2, anything like that, a house. Um, some of you know my house is on a landslip, so um, it's something to be very worried about. Um, utilities, whatever. It's the classic thing that uh, you work on and the BGS are always asked to deal with. And if we understand the processes, then we should be able to predict how the materials are going to behave under those various forces. And so I'll try to get a process-based stratigraphy. Um, so I've tried to avoid all complexities of present schemes. And I've tried to add additional information, which will be of value to people who need this information to use it. And I've started with what I've said of the forcing factors, the surface processes and the tectonic processes. Um, so. What I'm trying to do, therefore, is to uh, represent these on a map that you could use. I would like to be able to evaluate them in a, in a way that's objective, so you can look at the information, you can make a judgment about them. Uh, I want to be able to generalize so that you can say that if you've got these type of uh, materials associated together, this is, this is what will happen. And I want to be able to put them so there's distinctive patterns that you can recognize and say, when you see that pattern, this is what's likely to happen if I build on it or I cut through it or whatever you may want to do. So I wanted to start with climate forcing then. This is what really has been important as the first driving force. And the climate forcing can be summarized in this figure here. And again, the details don't matter, but let's look at the time scale. That's the present, a million years, two million years, three million years. And the scale of these wiggles is the scale of the changes. And this is taken from deep sea cores, but you'd get the same result, but not as far back, from uh, ice uh, cores in Antarctica. And the point is, you can see there's, there's a distinct pattern of uh, wide changes between interglacials and glacials, intermediate between uh, interglacials and coldest episodes, and then here, relatively little change. And that is distinct. That is not particular to just one part of the globe. It's, it's a universal pattern. 
And that's the climate forcing pattern that has put the materials and created the landforms on our mid-latitude area, but it's done it everywhere in the world, but in different ways. And I'm, that's why I'm just dealing with this uh, cool temperate mid-latitude area. Now, this figure uh, has a lot of information, and I just want to, to talk about, to you about it for a moment, because this is the first stage of getting that information. And I wanted to go further with this. Ah, oh, microphone, sorry, yeah. Sorry about that. I wanted to go further with this and do some modelling, but uh, I've not been able to establish the contacts. So there you are. But essentially, uh, we've got um, effective surface processes operating in this part of the world related to these characteristic climatic conditions. And I've also introduced human activity. And I did this before Anthropocene became the, the vogue. But it's still the same principle. So we've got a cool maritime area, and this is what we're in now in this part of the world. Cool maritime, plenty of moisture, but no extremes of temperature. And then if we evaluate uh, overall in terms of the process work that's applying in these parts of the world, we've got slope processes, river processes, glacial processes, coast, periglacial, wind, lake, soil, and biological. And in this type of region, the forcing processes at the present time are essentially, we've got high energy processes along the coast because coastal processes are largely weather dependent rather than climate dependent. But these soil forming processes and biological processes, they really are climate dependent and those are important. They are very important. Whereas for instance, slopes are inter intermediate, of course, rivers essentially until humans came into effectively low energy processes. High precipitation is totally irrelevant. It's the constraining of that precipitation by vegetation that's so important. So low, we don't have glaciers, we don't have per, uh, permafrost. Wind, because the vegetation is low. Uh, lakes, again, because of the vegetated land so, uh, surface. Lakes fill slowly, usually with organic material. So that's the type of processes that are operating now. And it's just qualitative, but it has the potential for quantification. If we go to cold maritime, now cold maritime is the glacial in this part of the world, but it's glacial with a lot of moisture in the system. And that's terribly important because the glaciers build up, they turn on, turn off, and permafrost builds up, and it can turn on and turn off. And that's where the power goes into the system. So we, we see, for instance, glaciers become high energy process. A lot of work happens. Rivers have their spring discharges, their meltwater discharges. They're important. Slopes, devegetated, uh, melting permafrost, they're high energy. Uh, coast, because of permafrost action around coasts, they have frost shattering of the, the materials and they're high energy. Um, periglacial, self-evident, with permafrost and active layer processes, high energy. Wind, wind is not so important in this because there's usually a minimal vegetation cover and it's wet. Um, so that's just medium. Lake, of course, that's when your lakes fill up. Um, soils, it's physical processes which are essentially just contributing to the others and biological is trivial, inconsequential. Then the third generalised um, forcing process is associated with cold continental. Now, cold co continental is some of this happened in this part of the world occasionally. When there isn't the moisture in the system, there's the cold, intense cold, but there's not the moisture. And so there's far less work done. It's like parts of Antarctica now, which have got a landscape that's several million years old, simply because it's always been so dry. We've never been as extreme as that, but nevertheless, the principle applies. And so slopes are stable. Rivers may have a limited spring melt, so me intermediate. Glaciers generally don't do much work, but it's possible that they'll, they'll do work because of uh, pressure melt at the base, uh, causing them to do a little bit of erosion. Coasts, there's not the uh, active layer process, not the frost shattering. Um, Wind, of course, that is important because there's no um, vegetation and material can be moved around. And, of course, uh, lakes, as a consequence of those being small, as inconsequential, and those two not effective at all. But we can't, if we're going to deal with this, take this approach, ignore us as humans. 
messing about the landscape. And this has become a big issue with the Anthropocene and anthropogenic processes. And it is highly variable, depending upon uh, where you are, because what we choose to do. And so I've got a, a new category of V there for variable, and put that in on slopes and coasts and uh, wind, if we strip off the vegetation, uh, and soils and biological. But clearly, the sum of these is that lakes tend to fill up, um, whatever, however variable they may be, and likewise rivers their potential for uh, having high discharge because we uh, strip off the vegetation cover, that is also very important. So that then is where I start from. Those are the assessment, the qualitative assessment of the forcing factors. Now, that's the force applied, but potential energy comes into it as well. And essentially potential energy is a consequence of the steepness of the slope. And you could say that's tectonic, and it is to some extent. I'll come back to it later. But there's a second factor that puts potential energy into the system, and that's the change from one climatic condition to another. There's A, I've called cool maritime now. There's our cold maritime where everything was happening. There's our cold continental where very little was happening. And, and then we've got our human activity. And I've used letters A, B, C, and D. There we are. And I've taken in this way a change from now, cool maritime, to cold maritime. So this is from now to the next glaciation in this area, which is a moist glaciation. And quite simply, a lot happens because, as it were, the landscape's been prepared now. We've got slopes that have been modified by rivers um, and the, the mineral slope processes. But you get the power of the... the Cold maritime systems operating, then a lot happens. So you've got steep slopes created now, which put energy into the system, and we get high effects happening on slopes, rivers, glaciers, uh, periglacial, and lakes, of course, filling. Nothing much will happen to those because those processes are not terribly important. And coast with weather doesn't make a lot of difference. If we go from now, Cool maritime to cold continental, essentially not much will happen. It's only wind that will turn on, in effect, because you've stripped off the vegetation. But if you go from uh, cold maritime, B, cold continental, C, that's the glacial and cold glacial conditions, to now, those processes, particularly B, which does so much the landscape, will create a landscape in which the present day processes, the cool maritime processes, the river, the slow processes will be disequilibrated. And there will be energy in the system from those steeper slopes, those unstable slopes that will be created by glaciers, by uh, active layer processes, by mass movement processes. And this is what's called the paraglacial effect. And so if we go through these, we get this paraglacial effect. And we get these instabilities in our landscape that are simply a function of the potential energy that's been put into that landscape um, by the change from the cold maritime to the cool maritime, which we have now. And of course, with human activity, it really depends what we do. And if we bulldoze a steep slope, then we make it unstable, and the consequences are self-evident. So that's putting potential energy into the system. Now, <clears throat> this then needs to be generalised because you can't talk about every single uh, particular event um, in terms of those. And so I've generalised them in terms of Milankovitch forcing. And there's our climate uh, forcing. That's the same uh, pattern that I showed you a moment ago. And we've got, we can characterise this in terms of Milankovitch forcing. Uh, and so the, prior to around 3 million years ago, 2.5 million years ago, it's forced by precession. There's a 22,000 year cycle. And these changes are small. And these are low magnitude and short duration climate changes. And essentially, that characterizes that time. In the 44,000 year change, which is forced by obliquity, that's there, we're in the moderate element. We're getting intermediate scale changes. Uh, intermediate magnitude, intermediate duration. And then when you come into the present for the last 800,000 years or so, 
we are dealing with eccentricity first. They're the changes that take place on a 100,000 year cycle. And they're the big ones. They go from the interglacials, which in this part of the world could have a Mediterranean style climate, to the glaciers where you could have glaciers just pushing down, as they used to say, down to Finchley Road um, in, in London. So you can go from those extremes. And those are three patterns which we can generalize for because I'm hoping to make the case that they characterize the time and they produce the typical sediment landform assemblages. And so I've tried to summarize those. There's uh, precession, 22 small changes. There's obliquity, intermediate. There's eccentricity. And there's, in terms of the processes that I've gone through, and essentially, in terms of precession, not much happens. Our weather controlled coasts, and here we are. Soil's very important, biological, very important. Uh, Obliquity, our, our rivers begin to turn on and of course for the, the same reason. Periglacial in the mountains, that is important because it contributes to the rivers doing work. Um, the others, intermediate, um, they operate but they're not dominant. And then in, sec in eccentricity, everything switches on. So that's when the work is getting done in the last 800,000 years. So those are the those three systems are called. And I've, I've called them in terms of the materials and the forms that have been produced. So in terms of the eccentricity, soils and shallow marine. And the shallow marine is in eastern England. The obliquity, the 44,000 year, is in terms of big river systems. Rivers like the, the Thames, which drain from Wales, the Bytham, which drain from the Pennines, and the rivers of northern England that drain from the, the, the Pennines also. And the Solent River, of course, which drained across from Dartmoor down to the, the Solent area. So those are the major river systems. And then the glacial interglacial cycles, which are those big cycles that I've talked about in eccentricity forcing. But also, for the purpose of understanding the landscape, I've tried to suggest there's subdivisions of glacial interglacial cycles. So I've identified the last glacial maximum subsystem uh, in addition, as a special case, or not a special case, as distinctive from the earlier glacial interglacial cycles, because they have not, it's not been significantly modified by a succession of glacial interglacial cycles. I've la identified the last glacial interglacial transition system. That's the change from the last glaciation into the present interglacial. Self evident, isn't it? But that's when a lot happened, and most of our uh, problems are caused by this because it has not had time to adjust. This is when our paraglacial effects were taking place, and it has produced a very unstable landscape. And then our Holocene, which would be an interglacial, very vegetated, but human activity puts um, uh, strong forces onto the landscape. And I put those together. So that's a submelanchovic. So we've got two submelanchovic stages in addition to the last glacial maximum. So I've identified six uh, systems which have got characteristic geology which will be of use to people who want to use the landscape. And again, I've put another figure which have just identified those. And I've tried to pick out uh, where what is important. And last glacial into glacial transition stands out uh, quite markedly Come as that's the time when most things uh, have the chance to change. And this was just a summary of those. So we, if we take this summary, in the soils and shallow marine, we've got uh, lithological vari uh, variability. It's really uniform materials and local materials. The units are extensive. The geometry is simple. If we go to major rivers, we've got far travel material moving through these big rivers, uh, but they are uniform and they're extensive, and the geometry is simple. If we go to last, uh, so glacial interglacial cycles, in the area of glaciation, we've got complexity. Um, in the extent of the units, can be variable. Glacial, but in all areas there's dissection or aggradation. And the geometry of the units begin to be complex. The last glacial maximum, uh, uh, very complex, very variable, and again, in terms of geometry, very complex. 
last year's interglacial transition, again, very complex throughout, and limited extent, and that is important, the limited extent, so prediction has got to be specific to science. And then uh, Holstein human activity, universally complex, very variable, and the variability varies upon the amount of human in influence. If you try to test this by looking at the quaternary deposits and landforms in uh, mid-latitude areas, Britain, Northern Europe, and such like, um, and you look at the, the characteristic products for these various, the three elements that I've talked about, the obliquity, the, uh, sorry, the precession, obliquity, and uh, eccentricity, you actually find there's a lag in the system. That, in other words, these, these soils and shallow marine characteristic landforms and sediments progress through that from about 2.6 million years ago to about 1.85. So there's that lag in the system. And that lag is a long term because there's not a lot of power in this obliquity. So that is complicating what I'm saying. But it does allow prediction. If you go from obliquity to eccentricity to the 44 to 100,000 year, then there is a lag again. But it's only from about 900 to about 700,000. And there... Uh, it's not so long because the power that's coming in is removing the traces of this uh, 44,000 year system. So we have those lags that complicate things, but there are, when you look at empirically, you look at the evidence that's there from the work that people like myself have done, there are characteristic patterns with those superimposed on it at the times of change. Near tectonic in parts of Britain is uh, not easy to identify, and I've kept it very simple. I've cut the same processes, and I've taken regional tectonics, and I've just identified coasts as a major factor, because our coasts are all tectonically controlled, even if you have nuances like um, the uh, areas of a lot of erosion on the East Yorkshire coast, the North Sea Basin is the reason why that is there, and it's the... the, the Current erosion is a nuance. Um, so there's that tectonic control of our extent of land masses uh, and uh, um, water bodies. But then you do get local factors like glacial or hydro isostasy, and this affects our rivers because our rivers are all going up in land, going up more and more around the interflues until you get a flexure point, and then they sink, of course, into the, the seas. And, and the coast, of course, you've got your local factors in areas of ice loading, but also you, uh, you are constantly changing the, the stresses. And then I, I live in a, now in an area down in uh, Lime Bay, near Lime Bay, and there's, I would argue unquestionably, the reason why there's so much erosion there has nothing to do with the soft rocks that facilitate it. It's the sinking into the, the, the western margins of the English Channel and the rise of the land, which facilitates that process. So I put those uh, as those two Others exist, but those are the drivers. So, just to be on time, I just try to turn the lecture alive with just some examples of, of the processes. I won't spend long on this, but our soils and shallow marine, what we're talking about are things like clear with flints are on the tops of the, the North and South Downs and the Chilterns and the, the extensive plateaus of Dorset and East Devon. They're real, they're deep, they they're, don't build a house on them. Um, and if you look at the coastal area, we've got our big rivers, and at this time our rivers are just transporting mud, which generally goes out to sea much further, or the, the tidal current and the wave processes are just eroding the pre-existing rocks, the uh, earlier neogene um, uh, and uh, pelagene rocks from this area, so that you get, you get things like the reworked um, sands, uh, of uh, some of the crag sediments, uh, and the same here, um, the reworked uh, pillaging sediments uh, reworked by coastal processes. So everything's local. If we go to the major rivers, these are our major rivers. There's the Thames coming down from Snowdonia or from South Wales. These are big rivers. There's the Bytham coming from the Pennines. Uh, there's the Bytham taking over the Thames, and you get the Mathan coming down here. And these are big rivers. They're organised. The, the changes are due to river processes. Um, they're not to do with glaciation. Although glaciers may be putting some sediment in 
from the mountains, but they're very well, they're river uh, processes. And so you get large bodies, often of coarse grained, but very well organized sediments. So they're manageable, they're highly predictable. And this is in, in Essex, this is where your Kitchgrave Sands and Gravels, near Chelmsford, and they're extensive deposits in, in East Anglia, which come from areas of Wales, Birmingham area, uh, and the, the Pennine. The other big river of the time was the Bytham River, and this come, is from erosion of the West Midlands, and so it's redeposing the West Midlands through East Anglia. Again, highly predictable, uh, an extensive deposit. The materials are what you would expect, and they don't change irrationally at all. Uh, rivers are organised, well-organised things, if they're given the chance. Uh, but it is interesting at this time, at least I think it's interesting, is that when you look at... These deposits subsurface beneath the glacial deposits depths. You actually find a neotectonic signal, and that neotectonic signal essentially affects the um, the, the precession drift, and that's those early low amplitude changes, because the the geomorphological processes don't have the power to shape the landscape. The tectonics has got the power at this time. And so you've got basins like the Stradbroke Basin, you've got other basins here in the Norwich area, you've got ridges and such like. Because at this time, the surface processes haven't got enough power to overcome the tectonics. It's interesting, by the time you get into the early part of the... Um, the um, obliquity, the 44,000 year driven changes, you lose much of that tectonic signal. You get traces, but you lose much of it. Um, and so it's there whereby surface processes are overruling the tectonic. Um, here's our, oh yeah, and also at the same time, throughout that time, our watersheds are rising. And so consequently, you'll get your terrace systems like those of the Thames and the Bytham um, and, and the Solent as the Watersheds go up and the margins go down. So it's very predictable, very manageable. And then uh, all that ends, I'm afraid. Um, we go into glaciation, we don't often know what to even call the things. Uh, depends who you are. If you had other people standing here that use different names to me, um, I prefer, to be honest with you, to use marine isotope stages. Uh, at least we're relating them to reasonable time intervals, which are reasonably well understood. And you don't need to keep changing names all the time, uh, which is, is dreadful. So there's the last glacial maximum, which is marine isotope stage two. I dare even put a name for marine isotope stage six. There's the Ragby glaciation. How many of you knew about the Ragby glaciation? A marine isotope stage eight. The old glacier 10, 12. That was the most extensive glaciation, the one that got to Finsbury Park. Yep. Uh, the Hazelwood glaciation, 16. Um, that's one approximation. But the point is, there's many times when glaciers came down into lowland areas and did their work and materials, which you're going to build, where is high speed two going through <laughs> exactly parts of these? I mean, you're not going to be a happy man. So, so this is it. And the glaciations, this is to give you a pattern. This is the overall pattern, very complex. This is the Haysburg glaciation limit around here. And this is what we're dealing with, tills, silts and clays, sands and gravels, highly variable. These are the exposures at Haysborough in North Norfolk when they were beautifully exposed at a time when the tidal currents made the offshore deep and the waves could do a lot of work. And we've got all the sediments exposed. That's changed. The sand, the pattern offshore's changed, and this is erosion's stopped. That's the big glaciation, as we understand it called the Anglian, marine ice up stage 12, and it came from the north and west, and it reached, there we are, the lower than this, the uh, uh, Finsbury Park area, um, and there's the limit through Essex. So that's that pattern. If we go to the next glaciation, see it, this is the one that created the Wash and Fen Basin, uh, and it deposited material in the Oxford area, and we've got tills here, glacial deposits here, made of material that's been eroded from there. That's why that area looks like it is. It doesn't look a lot like the underlying material. It looks like more like materials come from here. We go to marine ice of stage 8, which is a result of recent work that's been done on the tread catchment, and they see that glaciation coming in like this, like this. This work has recently been published in a big book on the trend and papers in the Proceedings of Geography Association. Uh, and uh, it's all very new. 
And then we take the, the only Scandinavian glaciation, the all the others are British, and this was Marine Ash Slip Stage 6. It's the one which is big in the Netherlands, but as far as we can tell, it only reached the North Norfolk coast here. And it certainly reached parts of the East Yorkshire coast because there's uh, enough sedimentary evidence to produce that. But those deposits have been obscured by the last glacial maximum. And the last glacial maximum reached limits roughly like this. And it produced a complex landscape. These are consequences of lake deposits. You don't like lake deposits. Um, uh, unstable moranic deposits, that by being that is constructural to topographic features uh, throughout those areas there. Deposits such as this, which that looks very uniform, but believe me, it's taken because it was characteristic. It doesn't stay, stay that form for very long. And you get landforms that are distinctive with moraine ridges like this, each of which have got the particularities for instability because of their slopes are produced by glacier construction and not related to gravitational processes um, that are affecting them now and the type of weathering process that's going to be taking place. And we get landscapes, which I hope you can see like this, with the lineaments all over them. And this is just the Pennines. Uh, that's Swaledale. No, uh, that's uh, Wensleydale. Um, but we see these lineated landscapes, and they are a function of glaciers. Glaciers are not there now. Those landforms are produced in response to a glacial force. They're now having to adjust to gravitational driven processes that are surface forces, and so they're potentially unstable. Um, and the consequence is that there's mass movement, there's river erosion, river deposition all the way along these areas. So these are, this is the time, well, glacial interglacial change is the time of major landscape change. It switched off the southern North Sea Delta. The southern North Sea Delta was a major feature that built up the southern part of the North Sea. It switched that off, and it hasn't switched on again yet. Um, it destroyed the major river systems. It eroded the Washington Fen Basin. It created the Straits of Dover and separation from mainland Europe. I won't make the joke you expect. So, yeah. uh, there's the change. There's the major rivers. This is what happened after those early big glaciations. It wasn't necessarily one. It could be a couple, uh, which were pre one's preparing the other. But there's a totally different landscape, a well-organized, manageable landscape to a highly chaotic landscape with very complex processes and limited distribution um, uh, represented by those types of river systems. So that's important. It also created terrain. It created various great thicknesses of, of superficial deposits with all their complexities. And it, the simple fact is, much of Britain, or England at least, wouldn't be there uh, it would be part, if it hasn't for the dumping of these materials. So it really is important in understanding our landscape now. Uh, and as I stress, a multitude of small, discontinuous, highly variable rock and landform units. LGIT, last glacial interglacial transition, time very rapid and short lived changes, just a few thousand years. Uh, but it really was a, a powerhouse that turned on and turned off in no time. We had a rapid deterioration of climate that put a lot of moisture, a lot of power into the system, the rivers and the, the slopes and the glaciers. And so we've got glacially eroded features like that, we've got clear terrain like that. I know they're not going to be heavily used for usage, but I've put them on to emphasize their character, uh, and that's where those would be found. Uh, but if we go to our slopes, it's the same thing that's happening. I've just taken this because I did some work, but this is in, in the Pennines. There's the landslips everywhere in an area that's characterised, and they can be very nicely dated because they're associated with uh, deposits within the valley, which related to that stratigraphy, and we know when they took place. But I've taken that, but you could take your Seven Oaks Bypass, um, or Tunbridge Wells bypass, um, uh, landslips all around southern and midland England, uh, dated this time. Dick Chandler did lots of work, John Hutchinson again, dating these things. They are characteristic. Uh, and the rivers went wild. For a short time, the rivers went wild. Now, when a river goes wild, it doesn't produce just nice terraces. It cuts great scour hollows and small channels, dumps large bodies of sediment as the river changes its face. And so our valleys often have got a shape like this with these 
bulges, bulges, and narrow sections. And this because the power is being used to reorganize the system, but it only reorganizes it locally in terms of that high power discharge. So these are of a frequency that relates to the, the energy of the river, which is a function of the discharge. Um, and the velocity, but the discharge, uh, which is determining most factors. And so you've got these highly complex river systems. If you've got a, get a, big, a sand and gravel quarry, make sure that you've got a big depression there, otherwise you could run out of sand and gravel in no time. Or if you want to build, expect lots of changes. You've got deformation structures like this at this time, which of course create all the problem, problems of variability. You've got uh, windblown deposits mixed in. They could be lursic, as in southeast England, or they could be sands, as in eastern England. Uh, so highly complex, and those could be weathered in various ways, which again increases the, uh, with organic material, which in case increases the variability. Uh, just a character of some of the soils. When you've got organic layers like that, you know the consequence of that. Very variable indeed. So these are all last glacial interglacial transition. And of course, I won't dwell on Holocene and human activity. Essentially, the Holocene is an interglacial. Essentially, it should be highly vegetated, well-organized rivers, and slow rates of change. But of course, we've, we've messed all that up. And since we started cutting down the forests, we've had colluvial process, we've had river flooding. Um, we've had all those consequences. And so we get things like uh, flooding here, and uh, we get um, uh, materials deposited in the karst lands, the marine muds of uh, Scotland, but of all our estuaries, the reason we have muddy estuaries is simply because humans have let the soils that are produced in the Holocene and are presently glacial be eroded and transported down to the coast. If you have, for the other interglacials, the coastal processes are not estuarine muds, they're sands and sands and gravels because the muds were not being eroded, except interestingly enough, in one of the interglacials, which had a lot of hippopotamus in them, and hippopotamus like rivers, and they like wallowing around in the mud. And I argue the argument is they produced the muds that got into those uh, coastal systems. Believe that if you want. Um, but actually, the empirical evidence is there. Uh, just again, Holocene human. You can tell that's a quarry, and, and there's the coastal management. So that's self evident. So this is the summary of what I've been saying, um, and I won't repeat it again, except that that's organised, that's organised, that's rivers, that's complicated, that's very complicated, that's infinitely complicated, and then that's where we've messed everything up. And you can use that to predict landscape potential. These areas, are the brown, light brown areas, the, the last glacial into glacial transition materials. You can predict flooding, uh, and this is areas where uh, human activity has come in, and so we're dealing with areas like broads and where we've managed our rivers, uh, or not managed them, as the case may be. We can talk about compressible soils, where we can predict where our peats and our paleosols and our wind-blown silts are, so we can predict those. Uh, we can predict aggregate quality. So, for instance, in, well, the best... Uh, uh, major river systems, we've got very high quality, the sands and gravels. Perfect. They did a beautiful job of producing an aggregate. Glaciers and meltwater are not so selective, so you're highly variable. You may be lucky, you may be unlucky. And last glacial interglacial inter inter transition, if you want your aggregate, you really need to do a jolly good survey first, otherwise you could go bust. Put all that together, I've tried to create a matrix based upon those six um, systems, and those are the processes, these colours, and I've produced a map, and this is actually the, the 2010 paper, and that, because of this scale, is just of, uh, of, of, of Britain, and it just is a map that shows the distribution of those elements. So basically, in terms of the process I've been talking about, wherever the particular colour is, you should be able to anticipate them. But that small scale isn't a terrible great amount of use. Well, maybe it is. We'll see. You people will know. But you can go to a much finer scale because this is BGS information we're using. And these, I've just got three examples. This is the Beaconsfield map. 
and it's the same data that's put on. But the point that I'm making is that our knowledge about the materials that are characterized by my matrix, the matrix I'm proposing, is identified in terms of the process. And so there's paleosols in this area, and those paleosols are shown as paleosols, and we can anticipate what a long-established, clay-rich soil would behave like. And you could make your judgments from that, rather than just knowing it as what a variety of names, one of which would be clay with flakes, or plateau drift, or whatever. This is uh, the area of Lincolnshire, the Louth area, and we've got the, the glacial deposits of the last uh, glaciation, last glacial maximum, and earlier glacial deposits. Now, lithologically, they're both diamictons, both unsorted sediments, but their behaviour is different because the earlier ones have been reorganised uh, and the surface slopes have been de degraded by processes that occurred on them over long periods of time. The last is not so effective. It is less degraded and consequently it's more unstable. And then if we go to the Glasgow area, um, again, similarities, but you can pick out areas where it, there's potentially high instability. Potentially, the material would run to a void by knowing that they're formed in particular conditions and subject to certain processes. Again, so we just don't identify this as Devensian till, we identify it in terms of the processes that have formed it. My evaluation is that this is the way you could, uh, it's value to you. Um, and you can, I've got my process based stratigraphy, and it's terribly biased, but I've said that gives you the information you want, uh, whereas the traditional stratigraphy does not give you that information apart from clarity in terms of simplicity, and it may be that's the way we grew up. At least I think so. You can you, uh, represent the area with the method, but you can predict also. So I'm suggesting, using the scheme I'm proposing, you can predict. And I won't go into that because time is running out, but I'm trying to make the point that it has values to you people who are end users, and such as um, scholarship science. Um, we've got um, engineering, slope stability, subsidence, shrinkage, aquifer identification, they're all of value. So that's what I suggest this does. It gives us a scheme that's based on process and therefore allows us to predict. It, uh, this prediction uh, gets rid of a scheme with complex names that are important for time but not for use. Um, and it's based on these rock properties and geometry. From that, we went to another. We looked at this domains approach. Looking at prediction we then tried to say, can we quantify these areas? And the BGS with Steve Booth and John Wright had developed this domains approach, and I then was, got involved. And we've identified these domains, and they're not, the domains can be identified in any shape or form, whatever your interest may be. But at this stage, we took things like upland periglacial domain, lowland periglacial domain, and we quantified these in terms of the amount of superficial material, and then the processes that were forming those superficial deposits, which is the quaternary deposits. And so rivers, uh, deep soils and such like, coastal river, we now quantify this. So if you, for instance, are interested in one particular area uh, that's for your problem, you can interrogate BGS's archive, and you can get this information at all scales down to 1 to 10. 10,000. And you can plot it in exactly this way. But this is more generalised. So we went also um, dissected superficial deposits domain, which is Midland, England, East Anglia. Um, superficial deposits dominant domain. Uh, this is the areas of the, the last glacial maximum. There's the characteristic profiles. There's the quantities of material. That's how much you would expect, for instance, to find res uh, residual deposits or proglacial deposits with their high variable sands and gravel. You could go, for instance, then to mountain and valley domain. This is our upland areas, and again, you can predict those. 
and likewise the final one is estrine and fluvial, which is terribly important because it's where most of us live. And you can, you can, you can refine that in terms of the particular process you're interested in and quantify those areas and plot them out on the map. So we've developed this domains approach to try to go to the second stage and quantify that information and produce it in a form that you could expect to see how important these particular areas are. And this is Steve Booth, who tends to think these things out so very nicely. This is looking at increasing level of understanding or reducing uncertainty, and then the process of investigation or accumulation of knowledge. And so our knowledge is accumulating this way, and our understanding is increasing this way. And from the practical point of view, then it goes from our desk study to our mapping. And so you're doing... Uh, let's say a death study, and then you go to two kilometres a day down to a half a kilometre a day or, or less, depending. So you can plan ahead. You can do it in a practical way. So I do believe it. Well, I know it to be true. So there you are. So, yeah. And this, which has got detail, look at the paper, but it shows how these can be used for the various end users, the range of end users, the critical geomorphological and geological attributes that we've identified, the uh, issues that could emerge, things like shrinkage, things like stability, uh, route planning, and then those are the domains that, in terms of what we've done, that would contribute to those various areas. So again, it's a practical application, and hopefully it will bring some value. So I want to conclude um, by saying that I hope you, as people who use um, the your knowledge to understand the landscape for those people who build it on it and um, deal with it in various ways, that we can recognise factors that force landscape change. And if we can do that, we know those factors, we can predict. And that's what science is about. So it's really scientifically based. If at the next stage you could get a modeller involved, you could take smaller areas and try to get modelling and then test that against the observation. Uh, it'd be very complicated, much more complicated than most modelling of atmosphere and climate, but I think it is predictable because geomorphologists have done some of this already. We can get uh, what I hope are objective and quantitative descriptions. The objective of my uh, evaluation of the relative rates and the quantitative of the BGS uh, areas. And we can describe the terrains in terms of the surface and shallow surface geology. Um, and geomorphology. And we can do that in terms of the quaternary styles and the provinces and domains. And then hopefully we could use this knowledge to make predictions as scientists and engineers and leaving stratigraphy to stratigraphers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jim, I'm sure everyone will agree that was quite an interesting talk. Now we'd like to open the floor to any questions that you might have in the audience. Um, anyone, Dave? Hi, Dave Giles from Portsmouth. Um, can you talk us through the process when you had you took your um, Digimap GB50 maps yeah, yeah. and you've applied yeah. this reclassification in terms of the process? Uh, did you have to do that by hand or what, did you oh. manage to do that as an automated process? It can be automated now because everything is digitised. Um, the, um, the element that we had to put in was our own contribution to the process. Um, and that actually stems from the earlier scheme that I was developing. Uh, but in fact, all the information is on BGS Digimap, and uh, the areas uh, are, can be identified um, down to the 1 to 10,000 scale. And if you can select the area, then um, in terms of the BGS criteria, then you can uh, identify them, allocate them, and plot them. Now, say you went outside BGS's criteria, as I did for my scheme, which is all based on BGS work, that earlier scheme, I had to put my own input in to their data. So, for instance, their superficial deposits, I had to identify in terms of whether it was 
major river systems, whether it was uh, uh, soils and shallow marine, whether it was last glacial maximum, I had to do that because that wasn't on their scheme. And you may have, or one of you may have to do that uh, if you want it for some particularity, um, which I can't think of hand what it may be, but it may be an engineering particularity. But it can be done uh, because the information is all digitised and available in that sense. And I, I did it quite a long time ago now, and I was working at the same stage in the same rooms as the guys who were digitising the town. It was, a, it was a great experience. I was getting on with myself, and they were getting on, and it was a, it was a good experience working with them. So that is important because, you know, everyone's got their own problems in terms of their uh, solution, their problems they're trying to solve, and that is manageable. Any other questions at all? I'm Martin Geach from Atkins. Thank you, Jim. I Hello. saw that presentation a number of years ago. I think it was Holloway. I enjoyed it then and I enjoyed it really? most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to it. Did I, I give this a Holloway? Oh, yes, you're the guy who asked me to yeah. come here, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> and here you are. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so the, the booth map that you showed at the end yeah. there, it's a really important map and it's kind of leading into... Dave and the working group. I understand that booth map. Is that forming the basis for a lot of the land classifications in the perigatial publication that's coming out? Is that right? The, 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 the booth work came out on mid working party. The, the booth work, uh, the, the PGA work came out mid working party, which has now been worked in because it was fitting in with our thoughts about land systems and domains and provinces. And so that has been included in both the periglacial and glacial elements of that, that kind of a, that approach to developing the conceptual models. Fantastic reference map for practitioners to have yeah. as our starting point, pretty much. I'm, I'm so delighted, to be honest with you. Um, I, I ran, because that, that was Steve Booth and John Merritt's work, and I got involved because I wanted to see it published, because both of them were due to retire, and they had other priorities. And it was a pleasure to work with them. I'd worked with both of them, you know, for 20, 30, 40 years, uh, 30 years. Um, so it was no problem there, happy and Steve Booth, I told Steve Booth about the way it was cited at the meeting in Durham, and his head still went up there. So. <laughs> Good, I'm glad that was valuable. Okay. Any other questions at all? Please don't be afraid of asking questions that are relevant to you, because that's what I want to hear. Because in, I'm, I'm not an engineering uh, geologist, should be in view of where our house is, but I'm not. Um, and so the interaction between yourselves and myself, I think, is so important. And I felt that was the great success of the Durham meeting, which Dave had a lot to organise, where Quaternary scientists and engineering geologists came together. I thought it was a really successful meeting because we were all talking to one another with different lines of experience and trying to, to, to make sure we could talk in the same language. And I really felt it was a great success, outstanding. So again, if some of my language doesn't make sense to you, please do ask. Sorry, I did try. <laughs> well, if you do have any other burning questions, we can always uh, ask them when we head to the pub yeah, afterwards. Um, just to finish off, thanks again, Jim, for coming and giving that talk. Um, we've got a few, uh, obviously, evening meetings coming up. Uh, the key uh, dates to, to bear in mind are we've now got a, a day meeting in June for the glacial deposits, depositional and deformational processes and engineering characteristics, of which we've got various speakers. We're currently organising that at the moment. Um, so please do register. We've got uh, the information up on the, the website at the moment. Um, let's see where that's gone. I didn't touch anything, I swear. There we go. Uh, and then we've got uh, uh, also uh, a conference in October, which uh, we're still looking for abstracts for. Um, that's ground-related risk to transport infrastructure. Um, so if you can uh, submit those by the end of May, by the 26th, to Georgina, that would be fantastic. And then, of course, we've got the Glossop coming up in November, um, where uh, Dr. Jackie Skipper will be uh, presenting to us on the variability and uh, ground hazards. How does the ground get to be unexpected? Um, we're still currently looking for applications for the, for the Glossop Award as well, so that'll include a 500-word uh, abstract and uh, a CV submission, which is by the end of the month, so any young engineering geologist keen to uh, partake should really get involved in that. Um, so that's to be submitted to Emma Singleton, our secretary. 
And uh, those uh, who do apply need to be free on the 8th of June at Burlington House for the uh, finalist presentation. Um, so for those who are available, we're now going to head to uh, the Blue Posts, I believe, on Bennett Street for a quick pint um, and then informal question if you do have it for, for Jim as well. So thank you again for attending and uh, good night.